Chapter 11, Blade of Fire. Next morning, the view from the shop window was very different to what Daniel had grown used to. There were no canals, no colourful shutters. Instead, there was a narrow cobbled lane lined with unbroken rows of skinny houses and shops and scattered with stalls selling a great number of different things. Mr Silver explained that they were now in Paris. He invited Daniel to walk the streets with him. Daniel, who had not left the shop since his arrival, jumped at the chance. As they walked through the crowded back streets, Daniel raised the subject of Ellie. I told her to keep away from you until you've had time to settle in, said Silver with a resigned sigh. Was she rude to you? She has a habit of being rude. She wasn't rude. I like her. She showed me around and let me see her favourite wonder. Silver gave Daniel a sideward glance. She has a favourite? Yup, the leap of faith. As they walked, Daniel became aware that Mr Silver was undoubtedly disguising a limp. His right leg seemed stiff and he gritted his teeth when his weight shifted to that side. Do you mind me asking? Is it true Ellie can't leave the shop? said Daniel. Silver seemed caught off guard by the question. She has a condition that prevents her from going outside, he said. He did not elaborate. What sort of condition? asked Daniel. A disease? What will happen if she does go out? Silver grimaced and rubbed his leg. Look, Ellie is safe in the Emporium. That is all you need to know. And is it true that customers can't see her? Silver gave him an irritated look. Yes. And that's part of this condition as well? Silver nodded and grimaced again. No more of this, he said. We are not here to discuss Ellie. Of course not, said Daniel, and he knew not to push too far. Why are we here? Looking for something, said Silver. I'll know it when I see it. Is your leg all right? Fine. On they walked. Daniel soon realised that they were not out for a leisurely stroll around the sightseeing spots of Paris. They stuck to the back streets and alleys, visiting several shops and stalls in the darkest corners of the city, each connected to the elusive and shadowy world of magic. There was a shop whose owner claimed to be in possession of a magic carpet, a stall selling the blood of many different animals, and an old woman who sold potions and powders from a flat overflowing with rats. None of these places, though, seemed to sell what Mr Silver wanted, and each failure only darkened his mood. These are the places you were talking about, aren't they? said Daniel, breaking silence as they approached another winding lane. The magic places normal people can't see, or choose not to. Silver gave a nod. His limp had subsided a little, but Daniel could tell that he was still in pain. What exactly are we looking for? treasure. It occurred to Daniel that Silver must be ill. Was he looking for some sort of medicine? An apothecary sat at the end of the lane, leaning at a strange angle, as if it had been propped up by something that had suddenly disappeared. In the window, Daniel saw many dust-smothered bottles and jars arranged around a human skeleton. He hoped it wasn't real. The interior of the apothecary was filled with a silvery fog that stuck in Daniel's throat. A sharp metallic smell hung all around. Mr Silver purchased several items, among them a glass jar of black powder and a strangely shaped bottle filled with red liquid. But none of them seemed to be the mysterious item that he was so desperate to find. And by the time they left, Silver's mood had become quite black. Daniel did not speak as he hurried along after him. He did not dare. In a mood like this, the air around Silver seemed to crackle. It reminded Daniel of how the world felt before a thunderstorm. They had travelled some way along another alleyway, a shortcut completely hidden from the streets, when Silver stopped dead and clamped a hand on Daniel's shoulder. A little further up the path, a man in a ragged black coat blocked the way. In his hand, he clutched a dagger with a long curved blade that looked as though it had drawn blood many times. Give me your money and valuables, he said. We don't have any money, Mr Silver's voice was low and calm, but there was an undercurrent there, something sharp and dangerous. The mugger smiled. You wear a fine suit such as that and expect me to believe you've got no cash? I may be a mugger, but I'm not a mug. He held out his free hand, 
beckoning for Silver to hand over his wallet. Put the blade away, said Silver. I do not like knives. The mugger snorted. Well, I'm sorry to inconvenience your lordship, he said, but the idea behind my holding this blade is not to make you feel more comfortable, is it? He took a step forward, raised the blade so that it pointed to Silver's face. Last chance. Mr Silver did not move. He did not even blink. The mugger's gaze turned from Silver to his own hand, the one that held the knife. What? What's happening? Beads of sweat were forming on his forehead, dripping from the end of his nose. He began to shake, to gasp and squirm. What are you doing? he said through clenched teeth. It was then that Daniel noticed the knife trembling in the mugger's hand glowing red hot like embers of coal in the Emporium's fire. I can't let go, screamed the mugger. He dropped to his knees. Help me, please! He crumbled on the ground in agony. Mr Silver watched for a while, his face impassive. Then he made the slightest of movements and the mugger's grip on the glowing dagger was released. The man whimpered, nursing his hand. Mr Silver dusted a speck from his sleeve. He stepped over the mugger, motioning for Daniel to follow. I warned you, he said, without so much as a backward glance. I do not like knives. And that brings us to the end of chapter 11. Make sure you come back and listen to what happens in chapter 12 tomorrow. Bye for now, year five and six.